Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya wa al-mursaleen. Nabiina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma ba'd. Uh, today we continue um, with the texts. Uh, Ramadan, fiqh of Ramadan simplified by our teacher, Ustada Hanim uh, Sai. Uh, and we will continue, inshallah, where we stopped. Um, and that's from the chapter, uh, from where we stopped, and that's from the chapter of uh, Qiyam. Uh, uh, our reader may begin, Bismillah ta'ala. Qiyam prayer. Ramadan is a special month in which special salah, Qiyam prayer, is established on its night. Praying Qiyam during the nights of Ramadan does not only enable a believer to get immense rewards, but also helps erase all of the believer's past sins. Our Prophet وسلم, said, he who prays the Qiyam prayer on the night of Laylatul Qadr, believing and expecting the reward from Allah, all of his past sins are forgiven. Just a comment here. Uh, there is another uh, portion of the hadith that's more uh, appropriate for this section. Um, because the section is on generally Qiyam prayer during the nights of Ramadan. And this hadith, the specific hadith that was quoted, quoted um, is in reference to Laylatul Qadr. However, there does come a hadith with the same um, reward for the one who prays the night prayers. The Prophet والسلام, said, Man qama and perhaps this was um, uh, a little uh, glitch um, uh, to, to, to have mentioned this hadith here, um, as it's more appropriate to be mentioned under the chapter of Laylatul Qadr, as is, and you will see, inshallah ta'ala, that it is mentioned under the chapter of Laylatul Qadr. Um, so the more fitting hadith for this section is the one that says he who prays the Qiyam prayers in Ramadan, believing and expecting the reward from Allah, all of his past sins are forgiven, and it is also narrated by Al-Bukhari as well as Muslim. Now. Qiyam could be prayed at the beginning of the night right after Isha, or it could be delayed until right before Fajr, dawn. It could be prayed alone or in congregation, both at home or in the masjid. The minimum number of rakat of qiyam prayer is one, the witr prayer. It could be prayed one rakat, three, five, seven, nine, or 11 rakat. It could also be prayed 23 rakat, which is most common in the masajid today. The best qiyam prayer, however, is the qiyam that which accords with that of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for those who are able to pray it. He never exceeded 11 rakat, which uh, while each rakat was beautified with long recitation, lengthy dhikr and dua. He would, he would recite it Surah Al-Baqarah, Nisa and Anu, Imran in one rakat and he would stay in the ruku position as long as the time he stayed standing. The person who prays Qiyam prayer with an Imam gets the full reward of the Qiyam prayer if the person begins with Imam and remains with him until the Imam completes. Our Prophet وسلم, said, he who prays the Qiyam prayer with Imam and remains until the Imam completes the prayer gets the full reward of the Qiyam prayer for that night, Bukhari. Okay, um, just a quick notes, perhaps to help with uh, understanding this section. Um, qiyam is the term that's generally used for all the, uh, what we know as taraweeh and tahajjud, uh, basically the salawat, the salawat that we pray after Isha and after the sunnah for Isha, um, up until Salat al-Fajr, um, specifically or especially during the nights of uh, Ramadan. So Qiyam is the terminology that was used um, from the early times as we will come to see, uh, the author does mention um, how the term taraweeh came to replace sort of more or less um, uh, the, the term qiyam, um, but it's speaking about the same thing. It's speaking about the same thing. So qiyam is what is prayed any time between after the Isha Salah 
um, until the Fajr, and it includes, it's inclusive of what we call Taraweeh or Tahajjud and Witsr and all of that. And so the author mentions, I mean, when she mentions Qiyam, she's referring to the same thing that we are um, usually, uh, or we are you know, aware of. And you know, it's not something that's a new thing. Um, so yes, that's what I wanted to share, inshallah. Yeah. The story of Qiyam prayer. Our Prophet وسلم, once on one of the nights of Ramadan prayed the Qiyam prayer in his masjid and some of the companions joined the prayer behind him. On the next night, more people joined the Qiyam prayer when they heard about it. The third night, the masjid became full with those who intended to pray behind our Prophet وسلم, yet he did not show up. When he came out in the morning at Fajr time, the messenger وسلم, addressed the companions explaining why he didn't show up during the night. He explained that he didn't come out because of his fear that the Qiyam prayer would have been made obligatory upon the Muslims, like the five daily prayers, if the messenger وسلم, continued to pray every night in the masjid in congregation. The companions understood the compassion of our Prophet وسلم, and continued praying the Qiyam individually, some in their homes, and others in the masjid. Once during the leadership of Umar ibn Khattab Umar entered the masjid and found several groups of companions praying qiyam, each group behind an imam. Umar then commanded for all the groups to come together and pray behind one imam, the way our Prophet وسلم, had done in his masjid on the few nights he prayed in congregations. Umar himself didn't join the qiyam prayer. He delayed it to the later part of the night and prayed it at home. Thereon, Muslims prayed the Qiyam prayer in a congregation in the masjid right after the Isha prayer. Well, the story of Umar radiallahu anhu, the great companion, uh, who is actually the, the second best person uh, after the prophets, uh, he, uh, this story or this incident is a very well-known incident when he gathered uh, the, the companions to pray behind one imam. And he made a statement uh, that was uh, that became famous or or well known, where he said, um, or uh, um, this thing that he had that he had commanded in terms of getting the people together, he said, what a good bid'ah this is. And this is from where that terminology comes. Now, what's important is for us to understand the context and the usage of this terminology because this is in no way evidence or support for those who, who try to um, suggest that there is such thing as a good bid'ah in terms of the sharia, in terms of the religion, because the terminology of bid'ah, it's an Arabic terminology that has usages inside the sharia and outside of the sharia. And when we look at the context of this situation um, or this, uh, yeah, this, this um, particular incident, we see that what Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu an had done was not something that was an innovation in terms of the religion, because what he did is something that was done by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and that was stopped for a reason. So it was done by the Prophet وسلم, for a few days, as we have uh, as we have read, um, in terms of praying taraweeh in jama'ah, and because of a reason that prevented the Prophet وسلم, from continuing, um, that practice had stopped temporarily. And Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu an is the one who brought this very same practice that was done by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's the one who uh, made this practice continue. And so his terminal, the, the usage of his words, ni'matul bid'atu hadi, is um, in reference to what is, yani, uh, what's referred to as nisbiya, right? Um, and it's not haqiqi because it's something that was done by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So how can it be 
uh, something that Umar ibn Khattab innovated in terms of the religion. This is not something that Umar ibn Khattab innovated in the religion, but rather he had brought the practice that had been done and stopped for a reason. He just made it continue. And so with this, we see that those who try to use this incident as a reason for there being such thing as a good innovation because Umar ibn Khattab used the term um, of you know, what a good innovation this is, then we see that it is a very flawed argument because we know for a fact that Umar ibn Khattab was not referring to an innovation in terms of the sharia. Why? Because this was already done by the Prophet And what we know from the Prophet in this matter is his statement, alayhi salatu wassalam, kullu muhdathatin bid'ah wa kullu bid'atin dalala. All right, so this is something that was mentioned, uh, especially the first part, fa'inna kullu muhdathatin bid'ah was mentioned, brought by Hafiz al Nawawi in his 40 Nawawi hadith. And he took it from the ahadith that were mentioned by the, or brought by the early scholars of hadith, uh, the early scholars who co collected the hadith, Imam Abu Dawood and uh, An Nasa'i and other than them. All right, so we see the statement of the Prophet وسلم, which is clear cut, as Ibn Uthaymeen has explained. The Prophet said, Kul fa'inna kulla, every, and there is no exception that's made here. And we see that even the companions, uh, even if Umar, even though Umar ibn Khattab utilized the term, he did not utilize it in the term, meaning for it to mean um, a shari or sharia, yani uh, innovation, right? Because we can we understand and we can see how it's not something that was innovated by Umar ibn Khattab um, Also, uh, what's also in uh, importance or, or interesting interesting to note is that in this incident it is mentioned that Umar ibn Khattab had made them pray and they prayed 23 rakat is uh, which is um from where those masajid that pray 23 rakat uh, uh get their yani, um example from right where they get their example from wallahu a'lam Why is Qiyam prayer called Taraweeh? Did you know that Qiyam prayer is also known as Taraweeh prayer? It got its name from the world Istiraha, which the early Muslims did when they prayed Qiyam. They prayed it with a long recitation of the Quran, and in between, meaning after every four rakat, they took some rest, which in Arabic is called Istiraha. Because of the Istiraha, every four rakat, the Qiyam prayer was named Taraweeh. The special Qiyam prayer. When the Qiyam prayer is prayed on the night of Laylatul Qadr, the rewards of the Qiyam does not only multiply it by more than 1,000 rewards, but also helps a person erase all of his or her past sins if prayed sincerely and expecting the reward from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the one who prays the Qiyam prayer on the night of Laylatul Qadr, the night of decree, believing and expecting the rewards from Allah, all of his past sins are forgiven. Bukhari. And this was the same hadith that was mentioned. And this was a hadith that was mentioned, the very same hadith that was mentioned at the very beginning of this, uh, uh, the this, this sitting today, or the reading today. And this is where I was mentioning that it's, uh, it fits very well in this section um, for Laylatul Qadr. Allah Laylatul Qadr. Laylatul Qadr, the night of decree, is the best night of the year. It's a special night where the angels and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descend all night long until dawn. There in descent, the angels and the ruh, meaning angel Jibreel, alayhi salam, by Allah's permission with all decrees. It's a golden opportunity to increase one's good deeds as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
reward so generously on that night. Imagine, for each good deed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the generous, gives a reward of more than 1,000 months. For instance, if we pray the Qiyam on the night of Laylatul Qadr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward us just like we pray the same Salah for more than 1,000 months. And if we say SubhanAllah on that night, we'll be more rewarded the rewards of saying SubhanAllah for more than 1,000 months. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, the worship on the night of Al-Qadr decree is better than a thousand months. Layat al-Qadr is sought on the odd nights of the last 10 nights of Ramadan, as the exact night of Layat al-Qadr is unknown. Since Layat al-Qadr night is expected to fall on one of the last 10 nights of Ramadan, it is recommended to seek it on all the last 10 nights of Ramadan. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Seek it, Layat al-Qadr, on the last 10 nights of Ramadan, Muslim. If one strives on all the last 10 nights of Ramadan, as our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did, then there is a 100% chance for one of them to be Layat al-Qadr. So it is best to strive hard on the last 10 nights so that one can get the immense reward of Layat al-Qadr. Although every aspect of ibadah is worthy to perform on that night, the most important one is Qiyam prayer. In addition to the immense reward that we attain by praying Qiyam, all of our past sins will be forgiven if we pray Qiyam on Layat al-Qadr, believing and expecting the reward with Allah Almighty. Our Prophet Wasallam said, he who prays the Qiyam prayer on the night of Layat al-Qadr, believing and expecting the rewards from Allah, all of his past sins will be forgiven. Bukhari. The early righteous believers did not waste a single minute of the night of Layat al-Qadr. They spent it in worship, as our Prophet وسلم, said, as our Prophet وسلم, did, by engaging themselves in the recitation of the Quran, Dua, and Dhikr, remembering Allah. They prayed very long to Hajjud, Salah, until just before Fajr to the extent that there would only be time for eating suhoor by the time they finished praying. They made sure not to miss eating suhoor. Our Prophet وسلم, explained that dua on the night of Laylatul Qadr is answered by Allah the Almighty. Aisha radiallahu anha, as reported by Ibn Majah and others, asked our Prophet وسلم, what to say on the night of Laylatul Qadr. And the Prophet ﷺ advised her to recite the following dua. Allahumma innaka afuun tuhibbul afwa fa'afu anna. Fa'afu anni. It means, oh Allah, so you are all forgiven. Uh, the, what she was asked to say was fa'afu anni. Um, so mm -hmm. that's a typo. Fa'afu anna is just, um, instead of it being a dua for just me, uh, the noon and alif indicates plural, so you're making dua for others. So, um, meaning wise, it's more or less the same, except that fa'afu'anni is what you say when you're, you know, making dua for yourself. Um, and that's what the Prophet ﷺ had asked Aisha uh, 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 the great female companion, to, um, to say. It means. Allah, you are all forgiving and you love forgiveness. Please forgive me. Therefore, it is advisable to supplicate with the above dua repeatedly, in addition to our to your own dua. So, dear brothers and sisters, do not miss this golden opportunity. Strive hard to achieve the immense rewards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised on this blessed night, the night of Laylatul Qadr, as this chance may not come back again. About this last, uh, the last sentence that the author stated, this is something that we need to really pay attention to because we do not know when our time will come, our time to leave this world. And so we should not yani, behave as if we have forever in this world, in this life. And like the author mentioned, if we get the chance to stand later to Qadr and we ask Allah to extend our lives so that we may witness uh, this coming Ramadan till, 
till the end as well as more Ramadan um, to come. And uh, but if we, yani if Allah blesses us and grants us the ability to witness this night or even the month as a whole, we need to realize that this is not a guarantee that we will get it again. And so what that would mean is, yani we need to realize that we need to take advantage of whatever we have in terms of the opportunities to increase our good deeds, to multiply our good deeds, to get closer to Allah to increase ourselves in taqwa, which is the purpose of what fasting has been yani, decreed uh, upon us for. And we need to yani, really contemplate on this because how many people do many of us know within our community alone, right? Who were with us last year for Ramadan and who do not have the opportunity to witness this Ramadan or any more for that matter, right? And so we need to pay attention to this, inshallah. Now. Read day. Eid is known as the day of reward in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards the believers for spending the month of Ramadan in worship. It is a time of joy that Muslims share regardless of their social status, giving charity generously and visiting one another. They also exalt Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by saying takbir as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, what means in the Quran? And that you complete the, the Eidah, the days of Iddah, the days of month of Ramadan, and that you exalt Allah by saying takbir for guiding you and that you be grateful to him. So if you uh, for those of you who were present yesterday, um, you probably remember what we said about when we quote translations from the Quran and that we always try to indicate that it's the meaning of, and we don't necessarily say Allah said, because what Allah just said was in the Arabic language in the original Quran. And what we have is a translation. And so you'll notice that in the uh, throughout this text, the author mentions Allah said what means in the Quran, or the meaning of which is Allah said in the Quran, the meaning of which is, and so on and so forth. Right? And that's because anytime we translate into a different language, uh it becomes the meaning or the closest meaning to what Allah Azza wa Jal actually said. Because Allah Azza wa Jal uh, spoke and Allah Azza wa Jal, the Quran is his kalam and it was revealed in Arabic, in, in Arabic. And that is what the Quran is. So what we have is the translation or the meaning of what Allah just said. And that's why you notice in this text and in many other texts you may come across where the trans the authors would, you know, um say Allah just said what means or the likes of that. Yeah. Zakat and fitr. One of the righteous deeds on the day of Eid is to give zakat and fitr to the poor Muslims, as our Prophet وسلم, commanded, so that they can be happy as well and do not worry for their food, at least for that day. Not only will giving zakat and fitr purify the fasting person from love, vain speech, and rafat, 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 foul or obscene language, sexual relations, but also it is a great help for poor Muslim families. Zakat al-Fitr is given in food and not anything else. It is impermissible to give money or clothing as Zakat al-Fitr. Ibn Umar radiallahu an narrated. Should be radiallahu an Umar because both Ibn Umar and his father Umar ibn Khattab are companions. Abdullah ibn Umar. Uh, Ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma narrated and the messengers of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made obligatory zakat al-fitr one sa'a 
four of a two average sized man's hands full width from dates or from wheat upon a slave and a free man, male and female, young and old, from among the Muslims. He commanded to be given before people going to the Eid prayer, Bukhari and Muslim. That terminology is far. One star. Uh, just, yeah, now you can continue, Sheldon. Who must give zakat al fitr? Giving zakat al fitr to the poor is obligatory upon every Muslim who owns more than what he, he than what he feeds his family with on the day of Eid. He must give zakat al fitr not only for himself but also for those whom he is responsible for, including his children, wife, and any other dependent upon under his care. The best zakat al fitr is quality food that will benefit the receiver of the zakat al-fitr the most. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam commanded for zakat al-fitr to be given to the poor Muslims between the times of Maghrib on the night of Eid until just before Eid Salah. If it is given after Eid Salah, the person will not get the reward of zakat al-fitr. Rather, it will be considered charity. One must remember that it's not permissible to delay it beyond Eid day. When should we give zakat al-fitr? Giving zakat al-fitr to the poor Muslims on Eid day before Eid prayer perfects and purifies the fasting of the giver of zakat al-fitr. He who gives it before salah will have it accepted as zakat. And he who gives it after salah will have it considered charity from the charities. The messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, if it is given away before Eid prayer, it is zakat al-fitr. And if it is given after that, it is a charity from among the charities, Abu Dawood and Ibn Majah. Salatul Eid. Salatul Eid, Eid prayer, is a worship that Muslims around the globe are expected to perform on the day of Eid in congregation. It is considered a symbol of our deen in which the whole community is responsible for, in which if no one prays it, if, in which if no one prays their Eid prayer, the whole community sins. The messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam commanded the Muslims to come out to the Eid prayer, including the old and the women with menses, so that they can witness the good and supplication of the Muslims. While the one with menses stays away from the Musallah and does not join the Salah, agreed upon. So if, uh, from what we mentioned yesterday as well, uh, from among the things we mentioned was the terminology agreed upon. Now, we haven't really come across it written in this text. This is the first time that we are coming across it. But I did mention, uh, we did mention that it refers to what has been collected by both Al-Bukhari and Muslim, both by Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari, Abu Abdullah, and uh, Muslim Ibn Hajjaj as well. So the two, what has been collected by the two is considered agreed upon and it is the highest level of hadith in terms of reliability, in terms of authenticity. Um, this is uh, the highest level of hadith and this is has to do um, also with the uh, strict uh, criteria that the two imam has the two imams have set uh, for accepting hadith and we mentioned also how yani, the relationship between um, imam muslim and imam bukhari and their relationships with the great imams going all the way back to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and as a reminder we've mentioned that imam muslim was a student of Bukhari. He had taken hadith, a hadith from Bukhari. And Imam Bukhari was a student of and had taken from Imam Ahmed, the great Imam, the one titled Imam Ahl Sunnah. Uh, and he is the one whom the Hanbali Malhab uh, refers back to. And this Imam Ahmed learned from and took from Imam al-Shafi'i. Imam al-Shafi'i is the one who 
the Shafi'i madhab uh, goes back to. And it is the madhab that is most dominant in our community, in the Harari community. And Imam Shafi'i had learned from and taken from Imam Malik, who was the who is the one whom the Maliki Madhab refers back to. And Imam Malik had taken from Nafir al Nafir al Madani, and Nafir al Madani, the uh, great scholar and also Qari. Um, he was the Mawla of Abdullah ibn Umar. Abdullah ibn Umar, radiyallahu anhuma. So he took from Abdullah ibn Umar. And Abdullah ibn Umar, radiyallahu anhuma, the son of the great companion, Umar ibn Khattab, radiyallahu an, and he himself was a companion, took from the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we can see from this how they are connected. The great imams, uh, leading scholars who are connected and have this student relationship going all the way back to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is how knowledge is passed down. This is how yani, um, it's what continued from then and continues to happen up until today. And as we mentioned yesterday in the introduction, that's in, it is important to know who we take our deen from because we do not take our deen from unknowns. We do not take our deen from anyone besides those who are qualified. And those who are qualified are accredited by the scholars, yani who have been accredited by scholars, who have been accredited by scholars going all the way back to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we mentioned this when we were mentioning the biography of our teacher, the author of this text. And you may refer back to the recording in in this matter. The Eid Salah could be prayed from the time when the sun has risen and reach the size of a spear until Duhr. The recommended sunnah is to pray it in an open ground, such as an open desert or field. In the morning of the day of Eid, our Prophet وسلم, recommended to eat three days before leaving to the Musamba. Likewise, it is sunnah to take bath, wear perfume for men, and to wear the best clothes one has. It is sunnah to go through one route and come back using another, as our Prophet ﷺ did. It is recommended to continue saying takbir in abundance individually on the night of Eid and in the morning until you reach the Eid prayer. When reaching the place where their Eid salah is performed, one should not pray any sunnah prayer as it is prohibited. Rather, they continue to recite takbir until the Imam begins the salah by saying Allahu Akbar, because there is no adhan or itama for Eid Salah. The Salah is prayed as follows. The Imam makes seven takbirs in the first rakah, and then five in addition to the original takbir when starting the second rakah. The Imam raises his hands for every takbir, and then recites Surah Al-Fatiha and another Surah loudly. After praying two rakat, the imam completes the salah in the same manner as a regular two rakat salah. He then delivers the first khutbah, sits for a moment, and delivers the second khutbah, reminding the people of the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon them, as well as reminding them of the rulings that there are, that the, of the rulings that are need to be practiced on the day of Eid. During Eid day, it is recommended to say takbir three times right after every obligatory salah, starting at Maghrib, the night of Eid until Asr on the day of Eid. The takbir is said as follows. Go ahead, Rahman. 
الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله الله أكبر الله أكبر ولله الحمد and this is one of the, the one of the ways um, where it's three times to kibir Allah akbar Allah akbar Allah akbar la ilaha illallah Allah akbar Allah akbar la ilaha illallah um so also yani if you do two times Allah akbar Allah akbar la ilaha illallah Allah akbar Allah akbar la ilaha illallah or even three times both at the beginning and the end or the, in terms of the takbir the first and second um it's uh yani all have been mentioned by the scholars so this is not the only yeah, any uh, way of uh, reciting the takbir. Um, but uh, this was the chosen way by the author. All right, and with this, we conclude um, the text, uh, Ramadan, the fifth of Ramadan, simplified by our teacher. And uh, we ask Allah to uh, make us a people who listen to his statements and follow the best of it. And we ask Allah to extend our lives so that we may witness the month of Ramadan and that we benefit the most from this blessed month. Um, with that, we conclude. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu alayk. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu alayk. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik. Ala abdika wa rasulika Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.